This podcast is made possible by Planfall. Hi, this is Justin Judd, CFO of Bamboo HR, and you are listening to the CFO Thought Leader Podcast. This is episode 853. If all things are equal, just based off how the revenue is moving, we know what it's going to do to our profitability, our mix. And so keeping our eye on the ball on revenue is, and the pipeline behind it is, is oh so important. We also have to focus very hard on our expense growth factors. So think of that as your, your expense growth ratio to your revenue growth, right? And, and you can't have any one area where you know, if revenue is going to grow 3%, you can't have your expenses grow 6 you know? And so it's discipline inside the portfolio. And there's things that are declining, the expenses need to decline in line with it. And things that are growing, the expense growth has to be controlled and te- tethered and, 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 and stay in sync. And so we're always focused on that expense growth factor. Hi, it's Jack. On today's show, we speak with CFO Chip Zint, CFO of Deluxe. When Chip Zint leaped two levels in NCR's retail division finance hierarchy, he couldn't help but savor the moment and reflect that his career years to date, including the nights and weekends studying for an MBA, were all worth it. Still, when it comes to career jumps, where you land in the organization sometimes matters more than at what level. For Zint, who is named Director of Sales Finance for NCR's Retail Division, his arrival coincided with one of the largest acquisitions ever undertaken by NCR's Retail Division. Looking back, Zint tells us he had landed in the fire, a place where certain careers rise while others turn to ash. CFO Chip Zint explains why and much more after this. With so much change around us and your need for increasing agility, you have to equip your team to win and you have to do it now. Join over 1,300 companies of all sizes using Planful to help plan and execute with greater confidence. Planful integrates your critical financial processes to serve the data you need, insights you demand, and the answers necessary to manage your business optimally. Planful lets you plan better, close faster, and report more accurately. And Planful's not just for finance and accounting. It's for the entire business to plan, collaborate, and drive increased financial performance. Take full control of how you administer and manage all of your financial processes and data. And put finance first collaboration at the heart of every decision. When finance is a team sport, you can be a champion. With Planful, you'll be a champion of finance. Get in the game by going to planful.com to learn more. Hello, we're speaking with Chip Zint, CFO of Deluxe. Chip, welcome. Thank you, Jack. Great to be here. So, Chip, as you might know, we always begin by asking our guests to look back and try to identify some of those experiences they feel really impact their thinking, help shape their leadership skills, help them become a CFO. Anything come to mind? Yeah, so anytime I talk to anybody, whether an intern or someone new in their career, or even just a group that I'm meeting, I like to talk about my career in three phases. I talk about the trenches, the fire, and the transformation. Um, So I think that'll go well with your three key milestones you're looking for. But before I do that, I'll first like to talk about I didn't intend to go into finance as a permanent practice. When I was in undergrad, weighing my business school options, finance to me was a logical, get it under your belt, have it be your baseline. But I always intended on doing something else, whether it was sales, marketing, something more operational. That was always my intention. It was never to go into practice, which is why I didn't get an accounting degree. I got a finance degree. But that kind of leads me to the trenches, right? And so the trenches to me is, you know, I was born and raised in FP&A. So right out of school, I got an internship with NCR Corporation, started in FP&A, and I lived in the FP&A trenches for 
the beginning part of my career. And so that developed business partnering skills. And every year, something about the business reorged or changed. And it gave me more opportunity to raise my hand, do something different. And eventually it led me to a role where I was supporting a small division of NCR. It was a healthcare kiosk business. Um, it had strong growth potential, needed some investment, but ultimately at the end of the day, it was too small and the scale of a business that size to get the priority. So they ultimately decided to sell that business. And so I was sitting there as a pretty junior, you know, young, early 20 something year old fp a lead for that area. And I helped embark in selling that business and be able to carve out that business and save jobs for the people inside of it and bring back value to NCR. And so I got to develop the carve out financials, develop the TSA agreement for how we were going to sell the business and what it would look like going forward, go on the road with the leadership team, pitch the book to investors, and ultimately lead to a successful sale to a PE. And so I happened to be getting my MBA in the middle of that. And I got to tell you, that experience going through that work was more valuable than the entire MBA I got. I mean, it was real life experience being a finance leader, helping lead a, a company through something material. And so that was a very foundational moment for me and, and led me to the fire. But I'll pause there to see if you have any comments or questions before I roll into to that next step. No, no, uh, please keep rolling. And I just want to point out you were at NCR 13 years, so you really did make an investment of time. But please, I, please I continue. Did. I did. And I can talk more about that. So then I call the fire. So I after successfully finishing my MBA and doing all the things I just talked to about, I, I was feeling really good about where I was in my career. And I raised my hand and I got a promotion two levels above where I was. So I went from a manager to a director by raising my hand and jumping into a pretty big role. I was leading global sales finance for the retail division. Um, and the retail team had just finished what was one of their largest acquisitions ever. And it ended up just not being the best acquisition for that moment in time. Eventually, the company got through it. But the moment I raised my hand and jumped into the fire was the most difficult stage of that acquisition and integration. And so for a two-year period of time, I was running the global sales finance organization, effectively the number two to the divisional CFO for a business unit that had signed up to very big expectations, wasn't achieving them, had integration issues, technology issues. And furthermore, we, we irritated our largest customer who decided to stop buying for us for a year. And so I went through a two year period where my whole work-life balance shift the wrong direction, way too focused in work. My son had just been born, so I kind of wasn't there for the early stages of, of his development and, and really just got sucked into a really tough situation. But I'll tell you, I used to always tell people, you know, if you talk about an athlete being in good shape, I was in really good work shape, you know, and I'm, I never went into investment banking, but just picture this as one of those. You're grinding it out every single day, 2 a.m. just to stay on top of it. You wake up the next morning super early and you're already 50 emails behind. It was nonstop. And so I survived. It ultimately, what ended up happening is a lot of leaders left the organization were asked to leave or left on their own. And so I became one of the last men standing. And so it gave me many opportunities to eventually partner with the actual CFO of NCR. He stepped in to temporarily run the division as the CFO. And so I got side-by-side -side time with him. And he became an ultimate mentor for me. And I'll talk more about him later. But it led to an opportunity um, one day that I'll never forget. And it came up later in my career where at NCR, we had something called the, the OCR. It was the order cadence. Every Tuesday, you would get on the phone with the CEO, kind of the top 200 leaders of the company, and you would talk about orders you closed the week before, what's going to close this week, what's going on with the customers, what does it mean? It was, it was the heartbeat of the whole company. And we happened to have a, a call one day where the ELT member of the, the leadership couldn't be on the call. The CFO couldn't be on the call either. So I ran the whole day. And we start our calls with Asia Pac getting their commitment, Japan getting their commitment, and so on and so forth. And so I got to the ultimate call with the CEO, and the Asia Pac division had lowered their order commit by $20 million that day. And the NCR C CEO at the time was a very bright guy. I mean, amazing leader. He knew more than you could possibly know. So I'm still pretty young, pretty nervous about this. And I show up on this call with 200 people. And of course, the first thing he says is, I want to start with retail. I need to know what is going on. Because I had made the decision that 
the best thing for me to do representing the division was to present the most up-to-date factual update of the business, not show up and act like everything was fine. And so I did. I sat there for over an hour taking constant drilling from him on what's going on, what's, what's going on with the account, what caused it, what are we doing to offset it? I mean, just unbelievable pressure. And it was a very big experience for me that ultimately reflecting on later in life when I reached the stage where I directly supported this individual, he remembered that interaction. He remembered my willingness to stand tall, tell him all the facts, deliver the bad news and, uh, and stand behind it. And so, you know, sadly enough, the next day I wasn't uh, rewarded for that by my business partner. He actually was frustrated that I lowered his commit without talking to him about it. So the fire was an interesting time for me. I learned a lot about being a finance leadership, having to lean on your morals and what you think is right and just doing what's best for, for yourself in the business. And so, you know, that experience then leads me to what I call the transformation. And so even though it was tough and I learned a lot about work-life balance and, you know, just growing up as a professional, I got that exposure to the former CFO, his name's Bob Fishman. He's the CFO of Pentair now, who became a mentor of mine. And so surviving the fire, surviving that journey and getting to know him, it led to many, many opportunities for me. So I went on about a three-year journey of transforming myself as a finance leader, no longer an FP&A guy. I went into treasury. I led our debt capital markets organization. We took on a pipe with Blackstone. I got to be a part of that transaction, massive share buybacks, massive focus on returning value to shareholders, board messaging, M&A opportunities. It was an incredible opportunity to round myself out. That led into a six-month gig helping with investor relations, getting exposed to the investor relations world, both internally and externally, helping onboard a new IR lead. And then ultimately, it led me to the position of uh, being the, the head of corporate fp which is what brought me back to being that business partner to that really tough, uber smart CEO who was Bill Nudie. Um, and so that was really my journey at NCR. And so you commented on my tenure there. And like I said, I was born and raised there from internship to VP and ultimately a, a divisional CFO. And so what ended up happening is COVID came around and I reached a stage where I, I felt like I was at an inflection point in my career where I had almost been there 15 years. And a lot of people have told me, look, if you're going to be somewhere too long, you become that company's person. And so again, my mentor, Bob Fishman, he got me in touch with an incredible gentleman at Corn Ferry who we had a mentoring session and we talked about what I wanted to do with my career, where I wanted to be. And it was the first time I, I publicly told someone I want to be a public company CFO. He told me, he said, it's, it's rare for someone to actually say that. Most people, they strive for financial leadership. They're open to private equity. They're open to any route they can go. But it's rare for someone who's been in a company for as long as me to say, I want to be a public company CFO. How do I get there? And so that was an incredible moment for me because it's what ultimately led me to Deluxe. And we'll talk more about Deluxe here in a minute. But we had a whole conversation about what it is I want to do, what I'm looking for. And he very clearly told me, he said, Chip, this is exactly the role you're looking for. Do not answer the phone from anybody until this is the role they bring to you, right? And it was going to a smaller public company where I could come in immediately as the number two to the CFO with successor opportunity, not entitlement, but opportunity with board exposure and constant executive leadership team exposure and to come in with expectations and power to be a finance leader. And so sure enough, he called me about a week later, later and said, hey, the phone's going to ring this week. I need you to pick that one up. And it was the deluxe opportunity. Um, and that was really a career defining moment for me. And it's now where I am here as uh, finally a public company CFO. Excellent um, detail there for us. The, the relationship with executive search executives is always interesting. And what you just revealed is, is uh, to me, uh, was was something a little different. Did you ever feel you had to prove yourself to the recruiter? I mean, I mean, did you have to really uh, demonstrate that you were ready for this position? I mean, was there a pushback? Was it like get in line? No, I mean, there was very clearly. Look, it's got to be earned. You know, you either have to look at your career path and say, "I'm going to do it at NCR. I'll be here for the rest of my life." How quickly can I get to that seat here? Or he said. 
you have to be very confident in all of your abilities and everything you've learned along the way. And you need to go bring that as a bundle to somewhere that really needs you. Um, and so, you know, I came with high regards from the recommendation from, from Bob, my previous mentor to him. So I came to him with a little bit of clout and expectations that I was ready and could do it. The rest of it from there was opening the door and letting me kind of walk through it and prove my worth to Deluxe and ultimately get the shot. And for me, it was a moment to say, I, I was pretty confident that the experience I had had over those first 14 years of my career was unlike anybody else. You know, I didn't have a flashy, you know, get a part of a unicorn startup and, and go, I, I really went through the trenches. As I said, I went through the trenches. I went through the fire. I transformed into an operational leader and eventually an operator in my role as a divisional CFO. And so maybe a little cocky, I was pretty confident that I had a robust set of background and skills that it'd be hard for someone like Deluxe to find in another candidate. And so I entered the whole process with that chip on my shoulder, kind of saying, I am the guy for you. And when I interviewed with Barry McCarthy, who's our CEO, I, I sold him on myself pretty, pretty easily. So before we find out about Deluxe, curious about, you mentioned uh, treasury, a stint in treasury, and of course, investor relations. And that was towards the end of your 13 years at NCR, it sounded. Did you have to raise your hand to, to, to move into those spots? And it seems like you're already uh, have a, you know, the CFO path is becoming clear for you. Yeah, it wasn't exactly towards the end. After doing those, I did run corporate FP&A for two years, and then I was a segment CFO for almost two years. So it was kind of towards the 60% of my time there. Um, but it was in that role in the retail division when I was in the fire, per se, getting that one-on-one -on -one time with the CFO where I talked about career pathing. And I did raise my hand and said, look, I, I need a little bit of a break. A, I want to keep growing my career. And B, I can't keep going at the pace I'm going at. So what are the other areas of finance I should expose myself to? I mean, you can't just learn FP&A and be FP&A forever, or you're going to end up being an FP&A person, which is fine. But for me, it wasn't what I wanted. So I did raise my hand. I, I was given the opportunity, which was another reason I stayed at NCR for so long. They were incredibly loyal and supportive of me. They gave me the opportunity to meet with the treasurer, meet with the controller and talk about hey, I'm going to take a break from what I'm good at. And I'm going to come into a new area that's all new to me. And I'm going to come in at a pretty high level. I came in as a director, right? A complete lateral into a whole different area that I had no experience in. And so treasury stood out to me because in the treasury organization, you get exposed to controllership. You get exposed to IR, you get exposed to M&A, the board of directors. And so to me, it was the first one I thought I'd do. I thought I would do a stint in treasury, a stint in controllership, a stint in IR, a stint in M&A, all proper. And the treasury opportunity just, it, it gave me a bit of it all, right? It gave me enough controllership experience to know there's always going to be smarter technical accountants than me. So I'm not going to be a technical accountant and to learn how to engage with them. So, but yeah, it was raising the hand and asking for a chance to develop myself for a, a few years. A wonderful overview for us. So thank you for that. Now let's find out about Deluxe. Uh, you, you, you shared a little bit with us, but tell us about Deluxe. What does it do and what are its offerings today? So I'm going to start with where we are going to, right? So we are heading to be a payments and data company that helps businesses pay, get paid, and grow. That's, that's what we're moving towards. And you're probably like, well, I don't, I don't really know what that means. So let me rewind the tape here for a second. Deluxe you probably know who we are. We are the original check company. We're 107 years old, best known for writing checks, the personal check, the business check. That's who Deluxe was, still is a good piece of us, but we started out as a check company. And over the years, you know, it became a very big printing organization. And so we expanded into other printing avenues. So we have a big check printing business still. We have what we call our promo business, which is really business forms and business essentials, things that businesses consume in the natural course of business, all print and paper products. Um, and so that's what Deluxe was for 90 years. And then, you know, in the mid 2000s, Deluxe went on a journey. And by the way, those businesses are secularly declining, right? No surprise, right? The, the physical check, paper business as it is, you know, right? You went from paper to digital yourself. So declining area. And so in the mid 2000s, Deluxe, um, it couldn't grow anymore. So it went on a about a 10 year journey 
of acquiring 50 different businesses, all for the sake of good multiples, provide some revenue growth, you know, expand ourselves, but none of them really had any strategic connection to each other. And so what we found ourselves in when Barry McCarthy, who's the new CEO, joined about four years ago was a great set of assets, a great brand with fantastic customers, but no connectivity, not really going to the market as one customer. When he actually got announced as the CEO, his first customer meeting, the client said, great to meet you. Which CEO are you? Are you the CEO of this product, that product? And he was like, I'm pretty sure I got hired to be the CEO of the whole thing. Um, but we immediately had to go to work in kind of rebuilding the whole thing. We call it the one deluxe model. So bring it all together, leverage that that value, right? The value I told you is the customers, right? 4,000 bank partners, an incredible brand. Most people know what deluxe is. They, they may think of it as the wrong thing that we want, but they know who we are. Incredible sales distribution. And you know, we have a great sales organization. We have all sorts of Again, the bank partners, reseller capabilities, e-commerce capabilities. So we had these assets that were untapped. And so we're in the middle of a transformation. It was another reason I came here is because NCR was going through a transformation. And I grew up in that world watching that unfold. And Deluxe is, a, you know, five years or so behind them on that journey. And so I thought I could come in and provide a lot of strategic value. And so we're on a transformation to really integrate all those assets into one, simplify the portfolio, really figure out what we want to be going forward, invest in the right things, modernize the infrastructure, get the org structure right, and turn into a payments and data business that helps businesses pay, get paid, and grow. And that's that's the journey we're on here at Deluxe. You arrive in 2020, so you're two years into the journey. Can you give us any early milestones that uh, allow you to, to know you're going down the right path? Yeah. So like I said, you know, core deluxe is in secular decline and, and the majority of our revenue is in those secular declining areas. So I always say without really hard work, you're going to wake up every day and your business is going to be smaller. So you need to outpace that with customer takeaways, sales growth in your new areas or maniacal cost out or leverage. It's not all about cost out, right? It's leverage. And since I've been here, um, we have grown the last two straight years organically. We talk about sales-driven growth because that's our non-GAAP definition of it. But last year, we grew 2% on an organic basis. And this year, um, you know, it's not fully out there. We're not fully done yet, but it's going to be, uh, you know, roughly double that. So since I've been here, that, that's been the name of the game. It's a company that couldn't grow revenue for the longest time going way back. Not, we don't have great statistics to be able to tell you exactly when. We always say more than a decade, but... Growth is hard to come by. So two years worth of uh, revenue growth is, is great for us. And, and we're while still investing and driving the transformation, which is which is hard work in its own. And so that's the proof in the pudding that I have that things are working out well. I looked at sort of an, uh, an abbreviated uh, look at your your home page and, and what have you. And um, I, I thought, oh, they're they're doing something in the payment space. They're rolling out something there. Um and, you know, quickly, I was like, wow, that's uh, you, you have a lot of fintech startups in that space is who, who are your competitors as you roll out these offerings? And, and for the healthy degree, you can correct me. I'm probably too abbreviated there in terms of what your off your new offerings are. But what's what struck me was like, wow, uh, that's a very innovative space that you're moving into. Can this company that print check has a print checking business? actually compete in this very innovative well i would tell you one of the challenges of deluxe is there's no pure competitor right you have to break down our portfolio to really get at it but we're going to focus on payments because that's what you're asking about so inside of our payments portfolio to to simplify it the best i can for you we have a merchant services division. So credit card processing, that's an acquisition we just made a year ago. And then we have what we call our disbursements and receivables. Business. So merchant services obviously is a massive field. You know, you got the big, the big players, the FIS, the global payments, the Fiserv's, the world page, you know, you got all the big players. And then you have the micro players, the, the silvers and the toasts and squares who are going after food trucks. And so we don't play in either of those areas. Right. We're not going to go take merchant services processing for 
Walmart, right? We're, we're in the middle, right? We like to be able to take, go to true small businesses where the mass of the transactions are for the, for the economy, leverage our brand, leverage our distribution channels, leverage the bank partners. And um, we're finding a really good right to win there. We're getting a lot of competitive takeaways. And, and that's an area where we acquired a business, which we'll talk about later, that was growing roughly single digits. And we've already kind of expanded that growth rate to mid single digits through synergies, cross sell, leveraging the brand, really driving incremental attention to that portfolio. And so we can win. In the disbursements and receivables, that's, that's a little bit of a mixed field. So there's a lot in there. We have legacy lockbox operations, right? And so we compete with players like Conduit there. And, and that's literally where you, you're you paying your credit card bill. You, you get it in the mail. You got the stub. You rip it off. You maybe put a check in. You maybe write your credit card. You mail it off. You think you're paying your credit card company. But it's actually coming to our lockbox operations where we have physical people opening up the mail, running it through the software, making sure it gets to your account, paid everything on time and gets it all done. That's an aspect of that business. So you got different players there. And then we're moving to more of this receivables as a service, um, payables as a service. And so there we're competing against unicorns like like High Radius and Avid Exchange and companies who are hyper growth with amazing valuations that we wish we could have. Um, but they don't have the scale. They don't have all the all the modules, all the assets we have that we're putting the technology together to build an actual platform and go to market with one whole bundle. And so we absolutely think we have the right to win. And we're, we're pretty excited about our ability to inflect the growth rate in that area to offset our secular declines kind of once and for all and get operating leverage via the platform and the growth to be able to sustain ourselves. We always like to ask, of course, what are your top of mind metrics? How are you tracking sort of these multiple worlds that are under the the deluxe umbrella today? As you explained, some of the business is shrinking, some of it's growing. What are the metrics that you're looking at daily to make sure you understand how all of this is happening? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously the, the business mix is important. So at the end of the day, revenue is most important, and we're watching that constantly to understand. I mean, you can tell if all things are equal, just based off how the revenue is moving, we know what it's going to do to our profitability, our mix. And so keeping our eye on the ball on revenue is, and the pipeline behind it is, is oh so important. We also have to focus very hard on our expense growth factors. So think of that as your, your expense growth ratio to your revenue growth, right? And, and you can't have any one area where you know, if revenue is going to grow 3%, you can't have your expenses grow 6 you know, and so it's discipline inside the portfolio and there's things that are declining. The expenses need to decline in line with it and things that are growing. The expense growth has to be controlled and te- tethered and, 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 and stay in sync. And so we're always focused on that expense growth factor. You know, it's kind of an E to R ratio, but it's a different thought. thought. And then really, you know, honestly, from my seat, the seat I just departed as VP of corporate finance to now as the CFO, I focus all my energy on cash cash spend, returns of the investments. We're making a lot of investments that you could imagine, right? A company that's naturally declining, paper business, moving itself to digital, a lot of technical debt. We have to invest. But money's not, money's money's available, but it's expensive, right? So what are the returns? Really pitch me on the business case, focus on those IRRs. And then I'm very focused on the debt, right? Really looking at our leverage ratio. We levered up a year ago to do this largest acquisition to acquire our merchant services business. And so our debt levels, free cash flow generation, how we're paying down the debt, how we're bringing our leverage back down so we can go back into the market and do more. All of that is just so focal for me and everything I do from an operating cadence. Have you, since you arrived, did you reorganize finance in some way? Did you deploy the people differently? You know, when I joined originally to Deluxe as the VP of corporate finance, we were just going through a reorg in general. That's what brought me actually here. They created a new role for me. So I think the organization that was designed that is still effectively in, in place was the right org. Um, now that I'm the CFO, some of my immediate challenges have been filling vacancies. So it just it just happened to be circumstance that as the former CFO de- announced he was leaving a divisional CFO left for a private equity job at the same time. And so I get promoted into the seat and I immediately have myself to backfill as well as a divisional CFO. So no, no change to the org, but finding the right talent. And and I'm happy to say both roles have been filled with incredible talents and 
the, the, the internal one, the, the visual role, I actually pulled some, someone from outside of finance. I pulled a, a strategy, an operator person, someone with a finance background, but who's been, she's been living her whole life in strategy and operations. And so far it's, it's, it's been an amazing hire and she's doing a great job really driving forward the strategic thinking of the business and how it connects to all those things I talked to you about the revenue growth, the expense growth factors, the cash returns on what you're investing. She's bringing this strategic operator view into it and just really setting the standard for, I think, what all of the business partners need to be. You, uh, would you refer to her, her as an FP&A leader or is she more operations or some something between? She's more operations. And so she has a very solid, capable FP&A leader underneath her. She's the divisional CFO, but I, she came in with the mantra of being a strategic operator leader. And uh, she's got the FP&A and finance support underneath her to, to make her successful. Is data a big part of your life? I mean, we spend a lot of time speaking to finance leaders, clearly from the SaaS world, who have these wonderful lines of sight into their business, largely all digital, of course, their, their offerings and, you know, from the customer on back. This business, um, parts of it really must operate in in some of the same methodologies that have been used over time. But what would you tell us? I mean, where are you on the digital uh, journey as a company? And are you driving that now as well? Yeah, I mean, I am. I would say we're nowhere near where we need to be. I, I glossed over it in the history lesson of Deluxe, but no surprise, legacy business, 10-year run of acquiring 50 things with no integration, our systems are not in a great place. And so a couple of years ago, we went on a journey. It was the first leg of our transformation. We called it our six flags. It was modernizing the technology stack. So think Workday, Salesforce, upgrading our ERP through S4 HANA, Cloudera for our data lake, our entire Microsoft Office fleet, and uh, Anaplan for planning. So heavy investment in six critical platforms. And you know, most of them are along the way. The one flag we haven't planted, we say planting the flag, is the ERP. We've had delays, as you would expect, through COVID, work from home, virtual environment, got to get it right. And so that's the one where we just haven't finished the work to be able to say, okay, now we're stable. Now let's take everything we've done. Let's link it all together. Let's get great visibility to our data. And so really right now, data is not where it needs to be. I'm part of the solution to go drive it better. And it's we're stick managing it today. You know, hey... This is important insight. Figure out how to put a dashboard behind it. And I don't even care if it's a manual refresh every week. We need the visibility. Here's how I want to see it. But we got work to do to automate it. And, uh, and we have work to do to stand up our cadences around it, right? Because we need operating cadences that take that data and actually use it for actual insights to drive the business. So it's a, it's a key focus for next year for me. Nice, nice insight there for us. Understood. It's uh, it is a long journey. It's how old a company is this again? 107 years. It's already gone through several uh, transformations. Clearly, we always like to ask for uh, what we refer to as a finance strategic moment. This might have happened any time during your your career. Might have happened before Deluxe. Might have been your clearly the start of your NCR years, the end of them. Uh, but we're looking for a moment of insight that you had along the way as a finance executive, as a finance leader, and it led you to respond to the circumstances that you saw. Anything come to mind when we ask for a finance strategic moment? Yeah, it does. I mean, I would say, I think I'm truly living it right now. Obviously we're a public company, so I can't tell you too much, but I would say, you know, to, to be in the, the seat right next to the CFO, to be the person wanting that seat, you have all sorts of opinions, ideas, thoughts of how it should be done and you, you have all the answers. And so I'm in the chair now. So I've got to have the courage to actually execute on those ideas and champion them and, and drive that drive the change to the organization. And so I'm fully jumping in and doing that. I just can't talk a ton about that. So maybe I can come back if my uh, ratings on this podcast are, are good enough to warrant me coming back. But I, I can tell you, so I, I always say it was my moment. So you, you got to rewind the tape. I joined Deluxe in August of 2020. First, first company change I've ever made. So I'm onboarding virtually in the middle of COVID, never been in the office, never met anybody. I'm still learning the company. Um, and obviously I came in with high expectations that if I do the right job and I do it well, eventually I'd get the CFO seat. Three to five years was my timeline. I thought NCR was 10. I thought Deluxe could be three to five. 
Well, you get into early 2021, and I find out that the current CFO is going to be leaving, right? And so I know I'm not quite ready yet. I, I self-assess myself. I've only been here about six months. Haven't even been in an office to really ingrain myself in the culture. Haven't learned it all. So I'm not ready yet. But I immediately get a call from the CEO, and he says, look, I know you're not ready. You know you're not ready, but you are better positioned than ever. So I need you to step up and lead us. So I don't, I don't want to mislead you like I became the interim. The, the former CFO stayed all the way through to the new one came in. But there was a moment where we decided that we had to go make transformational M&A. So we went out and bought First American Payment Systems, the merchant services play I talked about before. It was the largest acquisition in the company's history. It was almost a billion dollars. And so all of this happened right at that same time. And so the organization just looked at me and said, this is your moment. You have to lead us here. You have to make this successful. And so it accelerated my onboarding at an unbelievable clip. I went from not feeling great about my understanding of the company, directly telling the CEO I wasn't ready for it, to effectively overnight, not only completely running diligence and understanding this asset we want that we're going to spend all this money on, but leading all of the banker calls, the, the financing calls. There, there was one moment where they had 75 banks on to, to work on the term loan, the bank group, and they sent over a list of 50 questions. And the night before, the, the former CFO said, well, it's customary for your role to lead this call. And I'm thinking, I don't even know any of these questions. And so naturally, I crammed, I stayed up, I did all the prep. And so I got on that call and I, it was a two-hour call, and I proceeded to talk for the entire two hours, answering every single question on my own with follow-up questions, detailing everything, and not a single follow-up question, and it kicked off the whole bank group. And so I got a call from the CEO later that day saying, Barry, saying, look, I was on that call, and wow, that was impressive. And so that was just my moment where the company had told me, I'm going to get my chance, but it's not yet. And I had to decide that's okay, right? Still three to five years. I'm not entitled. I know six months is too fast. And I stepped up and effectively we went from February of 2021 until June of 2021 working that deal up. And, and I effectively kind of earned my seat at the table. And so board communications about the deal, leadership team communications of the deal, it all came through me. And so by the time they hired the next CFO, I had earned my spot. And so the company invested in me and said, look, from now on, you're, you're here, you're at the table. You're going to get to, you're not an official ELT member, but you get to be included in every single meeting. I got included in every board meeting going forward. And so that kind of became my pivotal moment where I decided, look, I, I can do this here. And I, I added a lot of value to the company over those last four months. And now I just got to buy my time. I got to be a sponge. I've got to onboard this individual, make him as successful as possible and my time will come. And so that, that was my moment. So you, you ask of a strategic moment, but I call that my moment. Hey, it's Jack. I hope you're enjoying our talk with Chip Zint, CFO of Deluxe. One of the recurring themes of this episode, and certainly of Chip Zint's narrative, is his willingness to sort of step into the fire, step into where things are changing quickly, whether it's a uh, when he was with the uh, the healthcare kiosk business, stepped up to help sell it or carve it out, or whether it was when he gets promoted and leads sales finance for the retail group at a time when there's a sort of a troubled integration going on. Not not a great place in time. It was not the best of times or the worst of times, but a time of opportunity. Thank you, Charles Dickens. We'll now return to our interview with Chip Zinn. We're going to uh, jump to our mentoring round. Thank you for that. Uh, this first question actually kind of overlaps a little, but maybe I can ask it a little differently. If you, just what you just shared, if you could go back in time, what would you have told yourself that first two weeks as you, you know, all of what just transpired, transpired. What is the piece of advice if you could go back to the start and just say, okay, you know, buckle up and, and what, <laughs> what, yeah. what is that? Well, knowing what I know now, I'd tell myself to lead it like you're going to be running it in a year. Um, I led it, but I didn't lead it expecting to be 
the CFO this quick. And so, like I said, I told you, I've got a lot of thoughts and opinions and, and a lot of things in my mind about what we need to do. And I think I tell myself to just lean in on those even earlier um, because I found myself in the seat now where it's mine to take over anyways. We always like to ask our guests to reflect a little on the personal side of things. Uh, this might be something uh, somebody outside of work might point out to us. We're wondering if you have a daily routine or uh, maybe a habit that you're known for. Something, again, like a family member might say, oh, that's just how Chip does it. Or Chip, Chip <laughs> he's always been that way. What, anything come to mind in terms of a personal habit or a routine that you have, something you're known for? Yeah, well, don't worry. I'm not going to tell you I exercise every day or I floss because I do neither. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, you know, it's not necessarily a habit. I would say it's a trait I have, a trait I've developed over the course of my career that I laid out for you. That's a part of my routine. And so that trait is, even though I'm, I'm good in meetings making tough decisions, I'm fine making tough decisions. I always like to bring levity and a sense of calmness and a little bit of jokes and just calm people down. And the reason I do that is it's very clear to me why I do that. I went from intern to VP in one organization. I never had positional power. I always had personal power. And so over a course of my whole career, I had to lean on the personal side, right? I'm going to be in a meeting with you. I want to first make you comfortable I want to make you trust me. So I'm going to be casual. I'm going to be, I'm going to maybe joke and lighten up the mood. I may set a joke, but then when we get to the meat of the matter, you got my full attention. You're going to get my honest answer. I'm going to say no where I need to. You have my support. It's just kind of my, it's my style. And so even coming to Deluxe where I did come in with positional power, I couldn't be anyone else. I had to be authentic. I had to be, you know, genuine. And so I still, I mean, you can see it here today. I still like to be a little, funny. I like to be casual. I like to make sure people are relaxed. And in my sales pitch to Barry, you know, one of, one of the reasons he asked me, you know, why you, and part of my why you is I can handle an unbelievable amount of stress in a calming way. Right. And so when, when the world is tough and business is hard and inflation's running rampant and interest rates are going high and the whole business is starting to shake, I have like a six gear of calm. And okay, I can handle that stress. And a lot of it comes from this kind of routine of lighten the mood, a little bit of levity. Yep. It's going to be okay. You have my support. Let's get down to business. So, and I'm that way in my personal life. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. We, we always like to ask for a book recommendation. Thank you for that. We like to, it doesn't have to be a business book. It's fine if it is. Uh, but sometimes people give us something they escape with. What comes to mind? Yeah, so I'd be I'd be disingenuous if I told you I read a ton of books. I'm not I'm not a great reader. I'll be I'll be honest with you. Um, but when I do read, I don't like to focus on business. I I've worked so hard my whole career. I spend so many hours focused on work. I like to do other things. So the books I I usually read are typically recommendations of my wife, and they're usually about being a better father, husband, person, <laughs> right? Yeah. So the last two I've read, you know. Um, one was about being a better husband and one was about being a better father. And it was called wild things, you know, a guide to nurturing boys. And so I have three little kids, two of which are boys. And, you know, it was take your mind out of the business world and put your, put your father hat on and, and really learn about, you know, the life stages of little boys, what they need out of a dad, how you raise them, the support you give. And, and it was a fantastic book. And that book is written by uh, Stephen James and David Thomas. Great, great selection for us. Haven't had it before. I remember hearing about it uh, outside of the podcast, but thank you for sharing that. We're up to our final question for you, um, where we get to ask you to look forward on this journey that you embarked on. Uh, and we're wondering what your 12-month priorities are uh, as a CFO now. Uh, what would those be as we look forward? Yeah, so as a true CFO, um, I've got to grow myself into kind of a true architect of the financial performance. That's my personal goal as the true CFO. So, you know, I view it as the four legs of a table, your revenue growth, your profit growth, your cash flow generation, and your EPS. And 
being an architect that can make sure all of those four things are happening in conjunction with each other to really drive shareholder returns. And so that's that's my personal developmental goal. First time CFO, been in the role for four weeks. I've survived earnings in a board meeting, but I'm still early days here. When I look at the organization, my answer will be very FP&A in nature, so forgive me. But we talked about data. I need better analytics. I need uh, more visibility to the data, the analytics, the cadence we talked about of how we're going to run the business. Much more controls around our whole pricing strategy, you know, with inflation, having discipline around your pricing strategy, what you can do in contracts, how you're going to go bid an opportunity. It's just something we've got to build a greater foundation here for expanding the role of the business partner within finance. So I talked about my hire, my new segment CFO, who's more of an operator and a strategic thinker. I still need the FP&A natural finance people, but I've got to take what she brings into the seat and get all of my business partners, top to bottom, CFOs down to senior analysts. I need everybody to be a more strategic business partner. Um, and then really just, I have to unburden the org, the whole deluxe organization from budgeting and forecasting. We have a very difficult um, annual planning process. A lot of investments needed. You've got businesses in decline. There's mixed shifts everywhere. It's way too difficult for the organization. And that leads into how we forecast every quarter. And, and the burden's on me to kind of rapidly transform the entire budget and forecast process. Kempsent, thank you for joining us on CFO Thought Leader. Thank you so much. That was great. Hello, listeners. Do us a favor. Be certain to subscribe to CFO Thought Leader on Apple Podcasts. Or if you're an Android user, check us out on Spotify or Google Play. If you like the show, please recommend it to a friend.